grids then what are the different opportunities of different uh, stakeholders of the microgrid so before starting with the slides i will just uh, introduce it uh, introduce this content uh, with a uh, written presentation then we will get a better idea um, then we will move on to the uh, powerpoint uh, so let's see uh, we are talking hey, about uh, uh, your uh, ppt is no now i am writing uh, is it visible yes sir what i yeah yeah so yes, uh, then i'll i'll come back to the ppt so uh, uh, microgrids is what uh, we are uh, going to discuss so what are the different uh, uh, entities in a microgrid can anybody help me on this what all are there anybody from the audience is the microphone allowed for the audience yes sir yes sir will allow yeah 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 so if anybody can help me on this then it would be good from your understanding what all are the different entities in microgrid Sir, uh, renewables uh, generations yeah uh, smart meters yeah yes so i am writing here uh, smart meters is what you have mentioned then energy sources energy sources we normally call them as distributed energy resources they can be renewable energy sources or non renewable energy sources of course nowadays we talk about electric vehicles also then we have loads loads can be flexible or non flexible right non flexible loads then what else communication devices are there communication devices are there then what else anything else somebody has to operate this microgrid right operate this microgrid so the operator will take care of the technical constraints technical constraints sometimes the business constraints also business and economic constraints also uh, what are the business and economic constraints anybody hello sir yes anybody what are the different business constraints or economic constraints okay so let me come to, come to that so uh, what what could be an objective of uh, objective of energy management in microgrid normally what what do we take as an objective for energy management in microgrid it could be minimization of cost that could be one uh, objective otherwise if we are uh, going technically then it could be minimization of losses i mean network losses okay network losses or i can even go for maximization of profit maximization of profit then you may ask what is this cost cost of what then loss of course we know network loss we know profit means whose profit whose profit so to answer these questions whose profit and which cost we have to first identify the stakeholder who is the stakeholder from the microgrid or who are the different stakeholders uh, of the microgrid and their costs and profits should be modeled first mathematically modeled then it has to be formulated as an optimization problem so this is what we are uh, looking for uh, for this uh, i mean for this optimization to be carried out properly to be executed properly we need to a uh, basic understanding should be on the basic economic dispatch problem which you have studied in your uh, power system course what is an economic dispatch problem what is an economic dispatch problem normally what we do is we 
minimize the cost function minimize the cost function if we have four generating units and the output from each of those generating units is p1 p2 p3 p4 then we try to minimize this f of p1 p2 p3 p4 which is the cost okay cost now uh, so everywhere we are we are uh, doing this based on the different sources we have say if we have uh, renewable energy sources with us say if p3 and p4 are wind and solar wind and solar and p1 and p2 are uh, say um, uh, say a diesel generator and a fuel cell because i am uh, talking about microgrid uh, i am using these sources we know that a diesel generator cannot be very big uh, normally uh, in, a, in a bulk power system we do this for thermal uh, generating stations but here we are talking about micro so i have uh, identified diesel generator fuel cell then micro wind turbine and solar okay now what is the difference between these sources what about p1 and p2 and p3 and p4 is there any difference between these two sources with respect to their dispatch how about uh, dispatching p1 and p2 compared to dispatching p3 and p4 can we dispatch p3 and p4 is it possible it's not possible because they are non dispatchable sources wind and solar are non dispatchable sources which means we have no control over uh, solar and wind of course we have very limited control but whatever is available as energy as uh, from the solar irradiance or wind velocity uh, we cannot go beyond that so in that aspect uh, this is non dispatchable but diesel generator and fuel cell they are dispatchable sources so how do we treat these variables whether they are deterministic or stochastic p1 and p2 they are dispatchable sources so to minimize cost whatever p1 and p2 uh, are required that could be dispatched from units 1 and 2 but p3 and p4 are not like that it is not possible to dispatch whatever mm, it, it depends on the availability and the availability is also unpredictable there is some unpredictability associated with p3 and p4 so normally what we do is p3 and p4 are considered as uh, stochastic variables stochastic variables and p1 and p2 are treated as deterministic variables deterministic variables now other than solar and wind what could be uh, other stochastic sources say we have already talked about evs right what is the uh, uncertainty in ev output the uncertainty can be in the state of charge of battery then what else the uncertainty can be in the availability of the vehicle itself availability of the vehicle itself the vehicle should be available in the parking lot for charging or discharging uh, and if if at all it is available then the state of charge should also be uh, desirable then uh, the, the, the whatever activity we are planning whether it is discharging whether it is a v2g activity or a g2v activity it may not be uh, predictable so uh, with that aspect uh, this is a uh, challenging problem even though you look at it as a simple economic dispatch problem uh, now it has become a, a bit complex because of the unpredictability of different variables involved in the objective function so this is what we are uh, we will be discussing in this particular session uh, identifying the stakeholders what could be the objectives of each of the stakeholders then uh, how to formulate the, those objectives and how to approach the optimization problem and how to uh, earn maximum benefits by uh, utilizing the microgrid resources that is what we will be discussing so we'll come back to this later i'll i'll just go back to my presentation now uh, is my presentation visible
is it visible yes sir yeah okay so optimizing prosumerism with rooftop solar and ev integration in microgrid so we have already talked about microgrids what all things we have in the microgrid so two two entities uh, uh, i mean two of the entities are uh, rooftop solar and ev and how to optimize prosumerism prosumerism means the philosophy of uh, i mean uh, prosumers acting in the microgrid prosumers in the sense the consumer uh, who is acting as a producer also okay which means uh, normally you are a consumer because you are operating your loads at the uh, tariff framework you are uh, into uh, with the with the respective utility but if you have your own local energy source with you you have you are you are becoming a producer also so you can uh, inject uh, power to the grid and earn some income from that there or or save some some of your electricity bill partially your electricity bill from there so how to optimize that and earn maximum benefits now coming to the contents uncertainty modeling is one of the aspects as i already told you um, there is uncertainty um, associated with uh, uh, wind energy or solar energy or electric vehicle whatever is there even with respect to load also there is uncertainty so how to model those uncertainties is another issue so these are some methods for modeling uh, the uncertainty you can see here interval arithmetic affine arithmetic probabilistic models financial risk return indices etc now uh, how to uh, model the co uh, model the objective cost can be an objective then profit can be another objective or we can play with the prices also prices uh, i mean of course they they depend on the uh, market uh, equilibrium or or the demand supply curve uh, still we have some uh, control over the prices that we'll see in this particular presentation now uh stakeholders perspective which stakeholder we are identifying and what is the objective to be formulated for each of the stakeholders so these are the uh, things we will be uh, discussing now uh, see this example this is a uh, case study uh, this particular system is a low voltage microgrid a low voltage uh, uh, microgrid where uh, we have three different feeders this is a residential feeder this is a this is an industrial feeder and this is a commercial feeder so how they have modeled this particular system is that uh, in the residential feeder we have distributed energy resources but we don't have any distributed energy resources in the industrial feeder and the uh, commercial feeder for now we can have resources but in this particular example there are no resources in the industrial feeder and the commercial feeder now what are the ders connected to the residential feeder we have photovoltaics then fuel cell is there then micro turbine is there then what else uh, yeah a diesel generator is also there so uh, there are uh, i mean uh, four, four uh, different types of sources uh, available we can have more sources also micro wind turbines or electric vehicles or whatever now uh, see here uh, the the types of buildings are apartment buildings are there then then what else is there houses are there individual single residential consumer is there like that different types of buildings are available in the feeder now uh, say if uh, the house owners have electric vehicles in their parking lot and the schedule of the parking lot their, their normal routine is uh, give some information about the availability of electric vehicles in the parking lot and that is this one mm -hmm. information from the parking lot and uh, uh, the, the availability of electric vehicles now you see at uh, different nodes mm -hmm. when is the uh, vehicle available one to eight hours time is given and number of electric vehicles available at each of the nodes that is that that information is also there like that at each parking lot we have some um, i mean estimation of availability of electric vehicles uh, at least for our our vehicle uh, we have that uh, predictability but of course we don't know whether it will actually uh, uh, it is it is actually there or not uh, in the real time uh, horizon but but we can give this information prior to the real time dispatch so we uh, we inform the operator 
uh, each of these owners uh, uh, inform the operator about the availability of their uh, uh, parking lots i mean uh, availability of electric vehicles in the parking lot that is what here uh, you see so normally uh, the, the schedule is like this morning time uh, uh, all the vehicles would be in the in industrial feeder and the commercial feeder and night time they will come back to the residential feeder because they they, they come home then morning they will again go back to their industrial and commercial uh, uh, i mean buildings and they may charge from there also they may charge their vehicle from there also that we don't know at present that information is not given so this is what uh, is given now based on this if we are uh, trying to formulate an optimization problem or trying to formulate an objective what could be the objective either it can be cost or it can be profit uh, i mean these are economic uh, objectives economic uh, objectives or if we uh, go on uh, with the technical objective then we can have network losses or maybe voltage deviation minimization so minimization of uh, network losses or voltage deviation minimization voltage deviation means v actual minus v nominal hmm? so we need to minimize this particular uh, deviation so this can be another objective so uh, it, it depends on uh, i mean uh, on which factor we are uh, emphasizing more on based on that we will do it but in most of the cases we use economic objectives as um, uh, the the i mean uh, the rationale for uh, energy management in a microgrid because every project has an economic feasibility and if it is not economic economically feasible then we will not install the microgrid itself we will drop the uh, proposition okay so that is what we do now based on this uh, what could be the uh, philosophy for uh, uh, the, uh, formulating the objectives and constraints. Now, here you see in this particular uh, flowchart, see uh, the objective function is operational cost and revenue, which means revenue has to be maximized and cost has to be minimized. And here they have taken only operation cost. Okay. Now, emission cost, loss cost, outage cost. Mm -hmm. Anything could be taken, but all are converted into cost, which means emission, loss, outage, everything is quantified in terms of cost. So the total cost could be minimized. This mode is known as economic mode. This particular mode of energy management is known as economic mode, where everything is converted to cost and co total cost is the objective. Now, what about the constraints? Here, constraints are marked. DG physical limits for every source, we have some maximum power output and a minimum power output. So, P max and P min. Then, energy balance. Energy balance means it's an equality constraint. We know that PG is P generation minus P demand is uh, the load, and uh, which is equal to P loss. PG minus PD, P loss. So, this one is the energy balance constraint. So, these are technical constraints and grid voltage and loading. We know that uh, the nominal voltage should be maintained at each of the nodes and line loading should not uh, mm, violate some limits. So that is also a technical constraint. So these are technical constraints and economic objective. The objective is economic in nature and the constraints are technical in nature. This mode is known as an economic mode of energy management. Now, there is another mode. This is technical mode. So technical mode in the sense, you see here, loss is the main objective. Loss is the main objective. Loss is, of course, a technical uh, function. Okay, network loss is a technical uh, function. So we are we are doing uh, we are uh, executing the energy management from a technical perspective. So uh, our primary focus is on loss, but other technical uh, factors are just put, uh, formulated as constraints here. Now, uh, emission we have discarded here. We have not put it in the objective. Of course, you can put it in the constraint, but you, you have not put it in the uh, objective. Then DG operation cost and revenue also you have not put it in the uh, objective. Rather, you have just kept loss as the objective. So this is one example for a technical mode of 
uh, energy management in microgrid. Now, coming to environment mode. Here, the prime focus is on uh, environmental concern. So here you see your objective function is just emission cost. Okay, in the uh, above, above uh, case, uh, in the previous case, it was loss, network loss. That is why it was a technical mode. Then here we have emission cost. So emission is the prime concern. That is why this is known as an environmental mode of energy management. So identifying the objectives, identifying the stakeholders, uh, identifying the constraints. These three are the main aspects of any energy management problem. First, we have to identify the stakeholder, whether you are selecting the stakeholder, stakeholder as a, uh, an end user or the operator himself or the utility, whatever. So based on that, you have to model their transactions, financial transactions and uh, expense model, revenue model. Then based on that, you have to formulate their profit and uh, you can uh, formulate the objective by then. Now, uh, I have already told you uh, any objective. So, so uh, my objective, say if it is cost, then the decision variables could be uh, P1, P2, P3, etc. Pn. If n resources are there and the output from each of the sources are P1, P2, P3, etc. Pn, then we are minimizing the cost. And we have already talked about uh, the uh, deterministic variables and stochastic variables. Deterministic variables are normally uh, identified as the power outputs from the uh, dispatchable sources, and non uh, deterministic or stochastic variables are normally identified as outputs from the uh, output from outputs from uncertain sources. So here in this case, in this case which we have uh, seen here, EV is one of the uncertain sources. Then solar is another one. Of course, load you can model as a stochastic uh, variable, but uh, uh, mostly these load forecasting techniques are uh, very much accurate. The error is very less. So we normally go for deterministic approach for load modeling. But uh, that is not the case with solar and wind. So uh, we have to, uh, I mean, we need to use, a, use an efficient algorithm to forecast the solar irradiance and uh, wind velocity. And even though we have this such an algorithm, the operator must involve in such a uh, such an activity. The end user is not bothered about such activities. He is doing some other work. He is employed, so uh, his involvement won't be there. So this is the uh, I mean general uh, rationale. Now you see uh, what about uh, how how to model them as uh, uh, uncertain variables. So I, I'm I'm now coming back uh, to the the equations uh, i'll just uh, introduce one or two equations here and uh, remaining could be uh, self explanatory so uh, let's see one minute ah oh, here yes so one of the methods to use uh, to model the uncertainties is this one a fine arithmetic In affine arithmetic, what we do is uh, we model the nodal power injections. Nodal power injections in the sense power injection, nodal power injection for ith node is Pg minus Pd. Right, Pga minus Pdi. This is the uh, P injected. P injected is Pga minus Pdi. Now, Pgi is uncertain because if you are connecting a uh, renewable energy source at that particular node, ith node, then Pgi is uncertain so how to uh, model the uncertainty of pga that is what we are trying to do uh, now we know that uh, power is pi conjugate right pi conjugate so this i the current could be i conjugate could be modeled as ig minus id i generated minus i demand so i generated minus i demand is the injected current to the node and the injected current to the node is what is flowing through the line. It is a radial system. It is a radial system like this. Then here, IG is there. ID is demand. IG minus ID is what is flowing here. One, two means this is I12. Okay, this is what is flowing. Now, what could be the uncertainty in I12? This is what we are trying to model. 
that is what they have shown here by this particular equation hmm? i i j affine is equal to i i j naught plus two different terms are there you forget about the sigma and other uh, aspects the epsilon other things you just forget i'll just explain what is this uh, second term and the third term the second term comes from the changes in line current the changes in line current because of changes in the nodal power injection changes in the line current because of the changes in the nodal power injection and the sec third term uh, gives an idea about changes in the line current because of the changes in the reactive nodal power injections so two different aspects we are taking the second term deals with uncertainties in the active nodal power injections and second and the third term deals with the uh, uncertainties in the reactive nodal power injections reactive nodal power injections q so because of both these components there is a change in i i j which is the line current so delta i i j i am taking as the change in line current now it is uh, perfectly matching my i i j affine is equal to i i j not plus delta i i j and delta i i j is what is represented by second term and the third term these are sensitivities of line current with respect to sensitivities in nodal active and reactive power injections okay now i i j not is the deterministic current so initially if say we are assuming that the solar irradiance would be this much in a particular hour then that is a deterministic consideration we assume that it will happen you know, uh certainly it will happen so based on that you you run the load flow and you get a line current which is i i j not so now unpredictability is not incorporated and we are uh, anticipating some uh, unpredictability so uh, or uncertainty based on that there is a change in line current which is delta i to find this delta i we use the second term and the third term such an approach is known as this affine variable approach so this now the i i j tilde and this i i j tilde is known as affine current similarly you can model for affine voltage also so from affine voltage and affine current you could uh, evaluate affine power active power so um, here uh, we are not running the load flow algorithm once rather we are running the load flow algorithm multiple times each time when you are expecting an uncertainty in the power injection for that change in power injection you will again run the load flow every time you will repeat this hmm, so that you can find the sensitivity uh, terms second term and the third term okay this is how we model this is one approach affine arithmetic approach now there is a uh, more simplified approach which is known as interval arithmetic approach interval arithmetic approach here what we are doing is we are just taking all possible values of the variable say if it is current then i have i max i min okay this is an interval i min comma i max it is other way i min comma i max then v min comma e max okay this is another uh, interval now uh, if we run load flow with these intervals if everything is in interval form p min p max q min q max so if everything is in interval form you need to add subtract multiply or divide intervals in place of numbers in place of just numbers we are using intervals for addition subtraction multiplication and division so for that we need to know the interval arithmetic operations that is what we have done here x is an interval capital x is an interval capital y is an interval capital x has x1 and x2 as the intervals upper uh, lower limit and the upper limit y1 and y2 is there in capital y where y1 is the lower limit and y2 is the upper limit now how to add them x1 plus y1 x2 plus y2 like that you can subtract multiply and division uh, and divide so you have all these arithmetic operations possible in the interval arithmetic form uh, so uh, after running the load flow your solution will also be in the interval form so if you are taking a pq bus your solution will be v and l 
then uh, this V and del would, would be in interval form. If you have a PV bus, Q and del are the solutions. This Q and del would be in the interval form. So that is how we do it. But what is the drawback of this particular approach? What could be a drawback, a possible drawback? Anybody? What could be a possible drawback? This is a possibilistic approach and not a probabilistic approach. What is the difference between possibilistic and probabilistic approach? We are taking all possible values of solar radiance. And based on those values, all possible values of the power injection. But we are not bothered about how probable is each of those values? Okay, we, we have not taken the past data and we have not checked the frequency of occurrence of each of those values. We have just taken, if at least once we come across with that particular value, it is included in the interval. In that case, uh, uh, it, the, the, the range would be very broad or very wide. This P min, comma, P max, if it is like this, 5 kilowatt comma 10 kilowatts. It doesn't help us to take decisions because they are conservative bounds. 5 kilowatts is very less, 10 kilowatts is very high. You only say that from this particular node, the power injection could be in between 5 kilowatt and 10 kilowatt. That will not help you in deciding uh, or, or preparing yourself for the real time dispatch uh, process. Okay, so we need to. Uh, minimize the width of the bound or the range should be compressed. The, the, this interval should be shortened. That should be done. But this is possible with respect to mm, affine arithmetic because affine arithmetic gives a point estimate. You have only one value. Uh, your IIJ tilde or affine current line current IIJ is a single value. That is I naught plus delta I. And this delta I captures all the unpredictability uh, associated with the nodal power injections. Okay, so this is a point estimate. This is just a value. It is either 5 kilowatt or 10 kilowatts. That's all. And that captures the uncertainty also. But in here, in this case, you have only intervals. So practically, there is a difficulty. These are uh, uh, conservative bounds here uh, for interval arithmetic. Now, you there is a there is an approach uh, you can, I mean, um, uh, you can use a method to uh, compress these intervals. If you are able to form, I mean, somehow generate the probability distribution curve of the interval, say 5 kilowatts to 10 kilowatts. This is min, this is max. In between this min and max, if you are able to generate the probability distribution curve, say here it is 5, here it is 10. Now you know that some of these values are low probable some of these values are highly probable okay so even you can discard some of the low probable values and you can have some tolerance for the probability value itself hmm? or you can convert this to an expected value if you have the uh, probability distribution curve you can find expected value that could give you a point estimate okay Inter uh, instead of interval estimate you can get a point estimate there also so this is, these are two different uh, approaches. Um, I mean, how we uh, do this is a finite arithmetic. This is the one I, I, J naught. I, uh, I, this is a real part of uh, current. This is a complex part of current. Similarly for uh, voltage also, similarly for complex power. Everywhere we do this. And uh, so we incorporate this particular arithmetic approach to the load flow algorithm. Whether you are using newton raphson or Gauss-Seidel or any other uh, load flow algorithm, you treat the variables differently. That's all. Mm -hmm. That is how we incorporate the uncertainties. Okay. So uh, that is uh, uh, about that particular uh, section. Now we move on to frequency regulation service using electric vehicles. This is another uh, scope uh, of, uh, I mean, for the users to earn some revenue by uh, from the ownership of electric vehicles in the 
distribution system. So normally we don't have this particular frequency regulation service in India, but some of the countries use this frequency regulation service as a pilot project. They have started, and this is known as this is a one type of ancillary service. Ancillary service, which means even the end user, if the end user is an owner of an electric vehicle, he is contributing to the network by supporting the frequency. Hmm? So, uh, I mean, one individual cannot do this. If uh, a pool of electric vehicles are available for uh, this uh, V2G uh, vehicle to grid uh, service, then frequency could be regulated. It could help frequency regulation. Now we'll see how this is done. What is the uh, estimated annual revenue from frequency regulation service? Uh, uh, this is a case study in US. So, uh, let me take it. Is my uh, slide visible? Is the slide visible? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, now you see here. Um, say if you are buying a car, which is uh, Nissan Leaf, here they have taken a particular car, Nissan Leaf, one of the uh, prominent uh, EVs, EV models available in the international market. So uh, if you are buying it, you have some capital expense associated with it, right? Capital expense associated with it. Then for this capital expense, uh, the government may give a subsidy government may give a subsidy and uh, uh, normally you calculate uh, your savings based on uh, a petrol car comparing it with a petrol car a gasoline based uh, vehicle you compare it with a gasoline based vehicle and how much uh, you can save in the operation of the vehicle of course your capital expense may be more compared to gasoline based vehicle but here what they have taken is once you buy a car you are using it for frequency regulation service or this particular ancillary service and you are earning some money out of that so basically your break even period your break even period is going to be less with this particular service by involving in this particular service so you see annual revenue from frequency regulation service there is an equation given here r is equal to pr frequency into p megawatts into a PR frequency into P megawatts into A. A is availability to provide to grid, vehicle to grid service. Availability to provide vehicle to grid service in hours. Hours means hours in a year. Okay, hours in a year. Yearly, how many hours? Uh, I mean, in how many hours you can make your EV available for frequency regulation service? This is what. Now, P megawatts is how much megawatts you can support in a year. Okay. Now, PR frequency. PR frequency is frequency regulation price in dollars per megawatt hour. So, what will be the unit of R now? Dollars per megawatt hour is a PR frequency. P megawatts is what? In megawatts. Into number of hours during which you can make your vehicle available for frequency regulation service. So, your answer is dollars. Right. So, your R will be dollars. This is the annual revenue uh, generated by the EV owner uh, from the frequency regulation service. Okay, now let's see whether uh, this is a feasible proposition or not in case of a Nissan Leaf owner. Mm -hmm. Now, if a uh, normally uh, Nissan Leaf has uh, two uh, types of chargers, can be a level two charger or a mm, uh, level one uh, charger. Uh, now, now the the uh, capacity of the Nissan Leaf is 10 kilowatts. Okay, 10 kilowatts. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, he is, he is uh, see, uh, he can have some additional revenue if he is uh, doing this activity from his office also. Normally, he does this from home, his uh, house parking lot. But when he is going to office, he, he is involved uh, in this particular activity, frequency support activity. In his office also, he can generate some additional revenue. Okay, now uh, the EV is available to say if the EV is available to provide P2G service at home for 15 hours, 15 hours during weekdays, 
weekdays and 23 hours during weekends during weekends so uh, what could be the um, i mean uh, total uh, uh, number of hours uh, in a year 6300 hours in a year he is ready to make his vehicle available for this particular frequency regulation service okay now how much he is going to earn let's see how much he is going to earn now as per this equation the nissan leaf owner can earn dollars 2140 hmm? okay but uh, uh, out of this 2140 a partial amount uh, a small amount will go to the service provider service provider uh, let's say if uh, 2000 is the mm, i mean 2000 dollars he earned from uh, any year hmm? in any year now uh, if he uh, is earning additional revenue from office also if he is buying a um, e2g capable charger mm, and and if he uses it uh, at office also then he can uh, have an additional revenue of uh, 6600 per year 600 per year so total is now 2600 per year 2600 per year now approximately if uh, 22000 is the total cost of 22000 is the total uh, capital expense for uh, buying this car if you have um, maybe in uh, less than 10 years in less than 10 years he is going to get back this amount right less than 10 years he is going to uh, get the break even period is less than 10 years so what what does it mean it means that uh, in addition to the savings you get from uh, using a battery in place of gasoline or petrol uh, you have another opportunity of uh, participating in the ancillary service uh, or or the frequency regulation service and earning from that also normally when you buy a gasoline based car there is no earning until and unless you give it for taxi service uh, there is no earning for you there, there is only expense but this is a, this is an additional uh, i mean add, uh, added uh, business opportunity you have um and and it is a bit futuristic but it may come in in the future one drawback of this is that if you use the if you use your ev battery for such services then the charging discharging cycles number of charging discharging cycles should be very high it may affect the life of the battery so the the battery's warranty is provided only for driving purpose it is not for v2g and g2v service gtv service of course they are charging itself with the gtv uh, service that could be uh, by that we can contribute to the um, technically we can contribute uh, as a flexible load that is fine but for g uh, for v2g service the, the warranty is not covered for v2g service at present no company is giving warranty for that that is for just driving purpose but this may change in future okay now they have implemented pilot projects in uh, us and uh, i think uk also has implemented it as a pilot project and uh, mm-hmm. they have earned good results they have achieved good uh, results from this particular project so that is uh, another uh, aspect now coming to the uh, rooftop in installations so now we have discussed basically two things one is how to model the uncertainty in energy management problems with respect to microgrid uh, it could be interval arithmetic or affine arithmetic or probabilistic approach uh, then how to formulate the objective and constraint uh, it can be in economic mode environment mode or uh, technical mode then identifying the stakeholders the stakeholder can be utility or uh, operator or end user and it can be profit maximization or cost minimization or network loss minimization or voltage deviation or any other objective uh now just before this session we also we have seen the opportunity of an ev owner in participating in the frequency regulation service and earning some money out of that so that is an additional business scope for the ev owner okay that is another
Now, uh, residential rooftop PV installations, policy assessment. This is another optimization problem. Uh, I will explain what is this. I mean, till now, uh, is there, uh, if you have any doubt, you can ask. Any doubts? Audience? Audience, you can unmute your mic. Yeah. If you want. If there are no doubts, then we'll continue. Okay. So, uh, residential rooftop PV installations. Let's see uh, what is happening with India with respect to residential rooftop PV installations. There are basically three different models available in India uh, for uh, residential rooftop PV installations. I think this is a broad classification. First one is consumer centric business model. Second one is RESCO 1 model. RESCO 1 model means renewable energy service company 1 model. Then RESCO 2 model, renewable energy service company 2 model. Okay. Now the first one, consumer centric model, it is shown here in the block diagram. What is there? What are you seeing here? The utility has nothing to do with the installation of the solar. The installation of the solar is done by the end user himself. The end user is installing uh, solar, taking loan from the bank. But he is paying EMI to the bank after taking the loan. And he is installing solar. And here the metering is net metering. So the power that he is injecting to the grid and the power he is using from the grid, the net import or I mean net uh, metered energy is what is calculated for his billing. So basically he is saving uh, on his electricity bills. Now, what about subsidy? So installation of solar, you see there are two options. Uh, either the end user himself can bear the capital expense or a third party company can do this. A third party company will come and install solar on your rooftop so that the capital expense is completely borne by the third party. And uh, the third party will sell the energy that is generated from the solar to the utility based on some power purchase agreement. Then what is your benefit? As an end user, you are leasing out your rooftop area. So based on the leased out area, you will get some leasing fee. And this leasing fee is a function of generated power from the solar. If the solar rooftop, which uh, the third party has installed, if that generates more, you will get more lease amount. That is how it is calculated now in India. So uh, we need to uh, I mean, have a thorough analysis of expense and revenue of the utility as well as the third party who installs the solar as well as the end consumer. This is the benefits of all three stakeholders. Now, we have three stakeholders involved here. One is the utility, another one is the renewable energy service company who installs the solar, and the third one is the end user. So, we need to model the benefits of these three uh, stakeholders and then fix the policies. The policy uh, should be framed in such a way that everybody should be in a win-win situation. And also we, we must encourage installing solar because we have 
uh, India has already committed uh, in the committed to uh, reaching some renewable energy goal by 2030 in the uh, Paris Agreement. So uh, to to acknowledge that, uh, to address that, uh, we have to encourage the government has to encourage uh, rooftop PV installations. But at the same time, the policy should not. Uh, should not be such that when implemented, it should not be biased or or it should not uh, uh, give benefits to one of these parties. It should be uh, there should be a win-win situation. So what are we doing for that? This is a work uh, done by uh, this is a very small work done by one of uh, our MTech students uh, in NIT Trichy. When I was in NIT Trichy, one MTech student did this particular work. Uh, he actually modeled the economics of all the stakeholders, the third party, RESCO, utility, and the uh, end user. So you can see here revenue of the utility, see revenue of the utility, expense of the utility, revenue minus expenses, profit of the utility. That is modeled. Okay. So he, but, but he has only touched the first model, which is the consumer centric model consumer centric model in the consumer centric model there is no third party installation installation is not done by the third party so we have only two stakeholders utility and end consumer utility and end consumer end consumer they have taken uh, as prosumer because he produces from the produces energy from his installed rooftop solar and he consumes power also so he's a prosumer. So we have two stakeholders, prosumer and utility, and we model the profits of utility and prosumer. But what is the profit for prosumer? Is there a profit for prosumer? Of course, he has expense, but what is his revenue? What is the revenue for prosumer? When he injects power to the grid, he is earning something that is his revenue. But if he is not doing it, say, if your connected load is somewhere around 10 kilowatts, but you are only installing a 1 kilowatt rooftop solar PV panel, then there is no question of injecting back to the grid. Right? You are, what you are doing is you are partially fulfilling your load from the uh, local energy source you have or the rooftop solar PV you have. So there is no... Uh, revenue generated by injecting power back to the grid so uh, is is that uh, does that mean that does that mean uh, there is no profit for the uh, end consumer if there is no revenue then there is no profit right there is only expense of course of course capital expense is borne by the end, end user or the the uh, prosumer and uh, there is no revenue but you should not take uh, you should not model uh, a prosumer like that because when you install uh, solar you have some savings in the electricity bill so instead of taking profit for the prosumer you can take the savings in his electricity bill because he is into some other job see if i am installing solar in my home i am into another job i am earning from that i am doing this for saving my electricity bill uh, to have some savings in my electricity bill but from from the utility perspective it is not like that utility is uh, completely into this particular service right they are their business is this so their profit must be pro modeled properly based on revenue and expense so here what we have taken is uh, profit is modeled for utility but profit is not modeled for prosumer instead we have taken the savings Savings in the sense, if you have installed solar and without solar, you have some electricity bill. With solar, you have some electricity bill. You take the difference, that is the savings. That is the savings because of the uh, installed solar. So now, savings of the prosumer is one objective. Savings of the prosumer is one objective. Second objective is profit of the utility. So your policy suggestions should be such that the savings of the prosumer should be maximized and profit of the utility must be maximized. Can we maximize both? Is it possible? 
what will happen if you try to maximize the savings of the prosumer automatically the profit of the utility will be affected if you try to maximize the profit of the utility automatically it will affect the savings of the prosumer so if you want to incorporate both as objectives of an optimization problem then you have to go for pareto optimization pareto optimization what is pareto optimization if we have conflicting objectives with us these are conflicting objectives if we are playing with the savings if we are trying to increase the savings it will reduce the profit of the utility if you are trying to improve the profit of the utility then it will affect the sales of the prosumer such objectives are conflicting objectives deal with such objectives you have to go for pareto optimization which means we only have a compromise solution we don't have a proper optimized solution let's see what is that i will show you say it's not here okay then i try it here Ooh. say this is profit of utility this is savings of prosumer okay savings of prosumer now how will the maximization problem look like it will be like this which means if you try to improve the savings of the prosumer the profit of the utility is coming down if you try to improve the profit of the utility what happens Hmm? you want a maximize you want to maximize it right the savings and uh, this one uh, uh, profit right so what we are trying to do is if you if your savings is less savings of the prosumer is less automatically the profit is increasing hmm? that is what happens but what we need is an a, a compromise solution which may which may be here we don't know we have to do uh, i mean execute the pareto optimization algorithm uh, and and then find the pareto optimal solution so we are finding a point at which both the prosumer and the utility are in a win win situation are in a win win situation so how do you do that when you do that you see here what, what are the decision variables here decision variables profit of the utility is depending on what tariff then feed in tariff what is tariff the rate at which consumer is consuming energy hmm? so tariff is a revenue for the utility what is feed in tariff when solar energy from the solar rooftop solar is injected to the grid the utility has to pay the prosumer right so it is an expense for the utility this is a revenue this is an expense i mean this this uh, is an expense factor this is a revenue factor then what else could be there it could be the pv size also because when uh, prosumers install large capacity pv panels profit of the utility will be affected because uh, they are getting less money in the head of tariff right they are getting less money so it will affect the uh, profit of the utility say if we are selecting these three as the variables decision variables decision variables and formulating the objectives profit and savings savings of the prosumer and profit of the utility now you are pareto optimizing them you will get the tariff value feed in tariff value and pv size values at which the uh, prosumer and the utility are in a win win situation win win situation in the sense we have a compromise solution so but we know that tariff and feed in tariff are policy uh, factors right policy decisions it, it should come from the regulatory commission or it should come from the utility side as a policy decision then pv size is the decision of the prosumer himself how much pv capacity i should install that is the prosumer's decision so this decision comes from the prosumer these two decisions come from the uh, policy 
so they 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 are policy implications okay profit has a policy implication hmm? uh, so that is how uh, it is done here so three uh, case studies we have done one is with maharashtra electricity board then uh, another one is with uh, tata power delhi and uh, actually we have taken tangent co also tangent co is not shown here come not uh, also we have taken with all these examples we have tried to find uh, how do we uh, i mean uh, we have tried to find a compromise solution with consumer savings and utility profit okay consumer savings and utility profit so for different pv panel ranges for 1 to 3 kilowatt 3 to 5 kilowatt installations 5 to 8 kilowatts we get the feed in tariff ranges 1 to 1.3 1 to 1.2 1.2 to 1.5 and the optimum pv capacity that must be used by the end consumer or or the prosumer okay then uh, we'll get the approximate savings 11 to 13 percentage utility profit in this case here also 11 to 13 percentage this is 8 to 9 percentage profit that is obvious because when you increase the pv panel capacity what happens is utility is getting less money in the head of tariff so utility's profit will be affected that is why it is reducing to 8 to 9 percentage so this is one way of uh, finding the policy i mean optimizing the uh, policy decisions for considering the benefits of different stakeholders so this is what uh, is with the uh, i mean this one uh, policy implications and uh, pareto optimization of uh, profits with respect to rooftop pv uh, installations so this is the this is one session and one more session is there one more section is there uh, which is uh, probabilistic reliability assessment but i am not going to that now uh, i i am i'm i'm winding up as of now if you have any doubt you can ask participants you can unmute and ask your queries yes somebody was talking i mean somebody was asking something so in general uh, our discussion was on three different things first one is how to identify the objectives and constraints for an optimization problem with respect to energy management in microgrid and how to treat the decision variables whether as deterministic or stochastic if there are stochastic variables how to approach them for optimization uh, whether it is interval arithmetic or affine arithmetic or probabilistic approach or whatever then we came to different modes of uh, energy management economic environment and technical then we uh, moved on to electric vehicle used as a frequency regulation service and how we can earn uh, some money by uh, the ownership of uh, electric vehicles for ancillary service support Uh, from the ancillary service support, um, what what could be the break-even period, and compared to uh, a petrol-based vehicle, what could be the uh, benefit? Then uh, the last topic was Pareto optimization of benefits of different stakeholders, and uh, how how to uh, optimize policy parameters uh, for optimizing these stakeholder benefits, including the utility and the prosumer. This is what we have. in a nutshell this is what we have discussed uh, today uh, if you have anything anybody is working in this area i don't know whether anybody is working in this particular area or most of you are from power electronics background i don't know uh, uh, that is why i i have chosen a, a kind of generic presentation at least 
uh, because if we uh, go deep into the mathematics, then it could be boring. So uh, if you have any doubts, you can ask. Yeah. Thank you, Vivek. Yeah. Hello. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Vivek. Uh, participants, if any queries, you can also later on can communicate directly with the expert and uh, can cl clarify your doubts. Yeah. Thank you, Vivek, for accepting Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the yeah for accepting our invitation and uh, allowing means uh, uh, with your busy schedule i know you are very busy but you couldn't deny me <laughs> so thank you uh, uh, participants please turn on your camera uh, so that we can have a snapshot uh, vivek can you please turn on your camera yeah yeah It's done. Thank you all. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Vivek. Yeah. Our yeah. next session uh, will be start at two fifteen, sharp. So all all the participants are requested to join before that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I will post now the feedback in the chat box. Please fill it up.